Tashima, thank you so much for having me to your art room today. There's so much to look at. Some of it's yours, some of it's your students. We're gonna talk about all that, but first, when did you fall in love with art? I think I fell in love with art the first time I can hold a pencil. Mm. So from, since I can remember, I was always drawn to um, cartoons and coloring books. <laughs> I always wanted a coloring book and I didn't use it to color. I used it to redraw the images. Oh. So I've been doing it ever since I can remember. Did you always use art kind of as a creative outlet as a kid? No, I didn't know that I was a creative until mm. I got older. Um, as a kid, I was the first grandchild. So I was the first of, you know, everything. The first cousin, the first right. niece. Um, so I was mainly like a protector. So that was my job. I protected everyone. I made sure everyone's doing their job. So I was like a little <laughs> mother to all of my siblings and cousins. So no art and creativeness took a back row when I was younger. But you did then go on to study interior design in college. So like yes. at what point did you think, okay, I, I have a point of view. I have an aesthetic here. Yes. Yeah, so I always dress differently. <laughs> so I guess I use that as my expressive outlet. Um, in high school, I didn't have room in my schedule for any art classes. So believe it or not, the last time I had an art class was in middle school and then again in college. So I decided when I got to college, I was only going to do creative things. So that's why I signed up for interior design and then it's gone from there. Wow. Yeah. When you made that decision, I'm just going to do creative things, did it feel like like a weight was lifted? Did you did you know right away that you were on the right path? Yes, I absolutely fell in love. And I always wonder like, why didn't I do this sooner? Ah. <laughs> like, why didn't someone tell me, hey, I think you're an artist. Um, but and at Ball State is where I went. I met this professor who I thought was absolutely crazy, but <laughs> I kind of fell in love with him. And the things that he taught me then, I still use now, even today in my classroom. Uh, and he kind of, not persuaded me, but encouraged me to become a painter. So I never painted ever until I met Scott Anderson at Ball State University and I fell in love and I've been painting ever since. So what was it that made you then go ahead and and finish a degree mm -hmm. in interior design even though you had discovered this love of painting? <laughs> because I was good at it. It came easy, yes. you know, so yeah. I finished it and I don't believe in quitting. So I wanted to finish out the program and I did. Um, what made me kind of turn my back on a program is when I got out in the field and it was more competitive than what I thought. <laughs> and I was like, well, this isn't really my passion. And although I'm good at it, I don't love it as much as those who are in the career working. Mm -hmm. So then I said, well, I guess I'll just substitute for a while. So that put me in the classroom. And then I went back to that kid who was, you know, the boss or the little mom. And I was like, oh, I love this. <laughs> and then I got in an art classroom and then it just clicked. I was like, why not do art, which is what I love now, and teach kids and just put it together. And that's how it happened. So, so you went, went back. back to school, yes. yes, which is never an easy decision, no. but I, I'm, I imagine you're glad you did. Yes. What did you learn in grad school about yourself as an artist? Did, it, did that sort of change during that point in your journey? It did. I learned about freedom and self-expression. That's something that you always hear and are encouraged as a kid. But when you become a grown-up, I don't think anyone's telling you, you know, hey, express yourself freely or do this. Right. I feel like we're put in these boxes. Like, no, you have to be an adult. You have to be this person. You can't wear those colors. You can't wear crazy hair wraps. You know, you have to do these things. In art, in grad school, I was able to embrace all of those freedoms and also embrace my expressive side of me. And then color, I love color. Yeah. <laughs> so all of these things were going on emotionally and it was just coming out on the canvas. And luckily I had great professors who allowed me to express myself, allowed me to work through all of those things that I was feeling, but didn't quite know where to place it. Then my love for portraits started. I wasn't very good at all. <laughs> so I just kept practicing and practicing and practicing and the saying is true, practice makes perfect. So I kept practicing and I would just, I love faces. So like even looking at you, I'm like, ooh, I put a highlight here and I you know, do these <laughs> colors there. And I think with portraits, my love for portraits is because everyone can relate to a face because we're human. Mm -hmm. So you can relate to that emotion, you can relate to that expression, you can relate to the joy, the sadness, whatever, through a face. So that's why I love portraits because it relates to everyone. I read that a lot of your portrait work is inspired by the women who raised you. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about that. 
Well, my mother <laughs> raised me. She's a very, very strong woman. And I mean, she just has this big, warm heart. And our house was the house where all of the relatives came to play. So all of my cousins came to my house and stayed the night and birthday parties or what have you. So when I think about my mom and even my grandmother and all of my aunts, they're just full of love and compassion. Like we grew up poor, so we didn't have much of anything, but what we did have was love and joy and peace. So it was always happy. It was always full of excitement. And I tried to convey that in my work. I feel like the women in my life have taught me how to stand strong in who I am. And it's okay once you find out who you are. Like, I feel like I'm the only creative person <laughs> in my family, so I didn't really fit in, but they still embraced me and they still let me know that it's okay to be who I am, which was always different, so. I've also noticed a lot of words mm -hmm. in your work. Um, there are quotes. I noticed that you have lots of, um, like a collage of Bible verses. Mm -hmm. Have you always kind of coupled the two together? I think I have. I start with an underlayer, and sometimes it helps to work out the thought process. Um, Cause there's a lot going on up here sometimes. <laughs> so I try to get, hone in on what I'm really trying to say or what I really want the painting to say. And I do start with a phrase or a word. And then this particular series, I did use, um, pages from the Bible, which I got that idea from one of my students, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, I use that for an underlayer. And then in other paintings, I use text or words. And sometimes I paint over it. And then I feel like the painting speaks and say, no, bring that back. So then I add it or repaint it. And then as I'm painting the whole process, I kind of start with an image of what I want and then it takes a turn. Mm. And then sometimes it becomes a disaster and then I have to fix it and then it becomes a masterpiece. <laughs> so it's a lot of um, highs and lows in the whole process. But I do love the text because sometimes I can't express it through the paintbrush. So I just write it out or just you know put it in there and then it kind of forms from there. I wanna talk a little bit about your job as a teacher. You have been here uh, at Marion for nine years, you said? Yes, this is my ninth year. What do your students teach you? Oh, <laughs> they teach me how to be brave. Mm. Um, a few years ago, I had a few students asking questions as far as when am I going to have a show? or where am I selling these pieces? And they always, they would come up to me and say, oh, Mrs. Davis, who is this for? And I say, oh, I'm painting it for some lady. Or who is this for? Oh, I'm painting it for such and such. And then they would just ask, well, when are you gonna paint for you? So I took that as encouragement and bravery to step out and become an art professional and a painter. And I tell my husband all the time, oh, I'm an art teacher. He said, no, you're a painter, you're an art professional, and you're an art teacher, so. Yes. Tell me about your, how you would describe your aesthetic. Expressive, eclectic, and colorful. And I want, when a viewer is looking at my piece, I want them to leave feeling like a sense of pride or joy or just something beautiful. Mm -hmm. I think I, I focus a lot on beauty. I, it's interesting that you say that because I, as I was looking at um, several of your portraits, I was thinking, I know that person, or like I can, I, I am that person, I can relate to that person, which is interesting, especially because a lot of your work is of African Americans, mm -hmm. but I like saw myself. Mm -hmm. um, is that, is there ever a, a goal to, for people to feel a certain way, or is it just overall, um, you know, aesthetically pleasing? That is the goal, and I think you're trying to make me cry, <laughs> but I'm going to keep it together. <laughs> um, that is my goal. I am naturally drawn to painting African-American female because that's who I am. Yeah. So I try to reflect that in all of my pieces. Even when I'm painting an African-American male, it still kind of shows up, that femininity and that beauty of the African-American woman. And then to have you say that, I'm just like, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. <laughs> because that's very important to me. I do want everyone to see themselves. And if they can't see themselves, then to see someone who is familiar to them, like a mother yes. or an aunt or you know, a baby or something that they can relate to. So thank you. What do you hope your students take away from your classes? I hope that they walk away knowing that they can be a professional artist and successful. Mm -hmm. So I am teaching them how to get rid of the bad habits that I had as a kid. We don't do anything for free. 
because their work is worth, you know, getting paid for. So I try to teach them how to price and sell their work and then just to take value in it. So I try, like whenever I'm framing, I try to show them how to frame or if I'm stretching a canvas and I have a kid who wants to learn, then I just take them alongside of me. I think it's important as an educator to raise up young artists. If that's what I'm supposed to be, it's important that I'm reflecting that, so. What is your favorite part of the process? the discovery when they get it, you know, because they come in like, oh, I can't do that, Mrs. Davis, or you want me to paint that large, or <laughs> are you serious? I'm like, yes, you can do it. And then once they're working through it and it, you, you can just see it, it clicks, something changes, and then they become the owner of the piece. That's my favorite part, because then I don't have to, I can step back and they have full control of it. It gives me chills, like even now, yeah. <laughs> it gives me chills, that's my favorite. I love that you love your job so much and that you are teaching these students that their expression is worth uh, everything. Yes. I'm gonna stop this love fest. Okay. I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I appreciate uh, you sitting down with me today and uh, thank you for, for being a beautiful artist and a beautiful teacher and I hope to talk to you again soon. Oh, thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you so much and I didn't cry. <laughs>